Hadley Arcus has um, agreed to uh, fill in as we wait for Dr. Jaffa to be here, because Dr. Jaffa will be speaking briefly anyway, and then we're going to open it up to a philosophical and Socratic conversation. Um, so in the meantime, as we're waiting for him, we'll play a few numbers for you. Have The best things to do on this occasion is just to ask you if you would just absorb with me for a moment Lincoln's cadences and just follow the unfolding of his argument and to sort of measure what Jacques Barson called the movement of Lincoln's mind. In did in the aftermath of the Dred Scott decision in 1857, where the Supreme Court held that you have a constitutional right not to be dispossessed of your ownership of a slave when you enter a territory of the United States. And they said, but you, things have gone better for black people these days, but you must understand that at the origin of the government, they were simply a servile population bearing no rights that white people were obliged to respect. This is where I pick up with Lincoln. I'm paraphrasing until the point I'll be quoting, and you can tell when the shift comes. Lincoln said, um, black people were voting in five of the original states. Now three of those states have rescinded the vote. He said, at the origin of the government, it was thought that masters had not questioned authority to manumit slaves of their own. But now there have been so many legislative restrictions put upon that freedom as to amount virtually to repeal. It used to be thought that legislatures had not questioned authority to abolish slavery within their own respective jurisdictions. But now it's become the fashion of late for constitutions to withhold that legislative power. The Declaration of Independence, once revered by all, thought to include all, is now construed and hawked at. That's and the same. And the same. <laughs> Until its founders, if they could rise from the grave, would hardly recognize it at all. It was once thought that Congress could bar slavery from new territories of the United States, but now Congress will not renew the prohibition, and the Supreme Court says it may not, even if it would. As for the black man, he says, the heavy iron doors have been closed upon him, so they have him now, as it were, locked in with a bolt of a hundred keys which cannot be unlocked without the concurrence of every key. The keys in the hands of a hundred different men, and they scattered to a hundred different and distant places. <coughs> and they stand musing now, wondering just what invention in all the dominions of mind and matter they can produce to make the impossible ability of his escape more complete than it is. It would be a grave error, he said, to say or assume that the public estimate of the Negro <coughs> is more favorable today than it was at the origin of the government. Now, whatever else, I think I have just about exactly, but whatever else we could say about passage of this kind is evident that it couldn't have been struck off by a Marxist or Hegelian. There's no sense of the history going on ever upward as the laws of history are unfolding. It's more of a classic sense that things can go backward, that institutions can become corrupted uh, in the way that the individuals who compose the institutions can be corrupted. So Lincoln would point out Senator Pettit of Indiana, who insisted that the truth of the Declaration, all men are created equal, was really a self-evident lie. Now here was a, an officer, a high, high officer in a republic. An officer in a republic founded on the consent of the governed, that, that flowing from the premise, all men are created equal, and he had an evident contempt for the very premise on which his own authority rested. It was a mark of the serious corrosion 
in the political class a loss of confidence and conviction about the very ground of their own authority. Now, our dear friend Harry Jaffa, who I'm sure will be back here, is, he made the most important mark with Lincoln. People would write these biographies, paint, paint uh, Lincoln as a man with a strong engine of ambition, a little neurotic. But uh, what Harry did was take Lincoln seriously and give an account of Lincoln, the substance of his, talk, of his thought. The place where Lincoln, almost without knowing the bibliography, virtually treads along the same paths as Aquinas and Aristotle. And that's what Harry disclosed. And he gave us, therefore, the most important books on Lincoln because he took Lincoln at his highest level. Now, uh, I was going to make something for my own talk tomorrow. Uh, Lincoln famously said at Gettysburg, four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth. A friend, uh, Jim Stoner, called me on election night. No, he said, emailed me the next, the after election. He said, did you notice that Barack Obama said 221? We've been building this country calloused hand by calloused hand for 221. No. There's the difference. If you count back 87, four score and seven from Gettysburg, you don't arrive at the Constitution. You arrive at the Declaration of Independence. Um, the regime, the Union, began before the This was the second Constitution. The regime began with the articulation of that first principle that marked the character of the regime. Lincoln said once that a word taken from Proverbs, that a word fitly spoken is like an apple of gold within a frame of silver. That the frame was made for the apple, not the apple for the frame. The Constitution was made for the Union, not the Union for the Constitution. The task of making a Constitution was to get a practical arrangement of power that would be consistent with the deep character of the regime and this was the second constitution. So Barack Obama counted back 221 from election night. He got to the constitution. And I was like, well, maybe he made a mistake. Maybe it was inadvertent. And what do you make of it? I don't know. I, I, I met him in Washington a couple of weeks ago. I didn't have a moment to ask him. Why do you say 221, huh? He meant constitution. I think, more perfect but, oh, union. That's right. Now, you, Lucas could talk about, no, you know, suspect. Could it be that he reflects that the fashions in the academy to invoke the declaration, but not take it seriously, because we don't take seriously any longer, that there really were moral truths that hold in all places, rights that arise from the very nature of human beings. It will be the same wherever those human beings, that human nature remains the same. So wherever we are in the world, we may not rule creatures who can give and understand reasons the way that we can rule dogs and horses. And in, even in this age of animal liberation, nobody's thought of signing contracts with their dogs or horses or, or <laughs> seeking the informed consent of their household pets before they authorize surgery on them. But we continue to think that those beings who give it understand reasons deserve to be ruled with a rendering of reasons. Well, that could be what, what the left has problems with these days, because it, it, it wars with multiculturalism, right? Uh, it, it stands against the currents of cultural relativism, and it, it still represents the classic case that we can speak of moral truths, and uh, uh, we can invoke equality, but at least the founders of Lincoln thought there was a principle that established the moral truth of that claim to equality, in the way that uh, progressives in our own time will invoke, invoke equality, but are no longer convinced that there is a moral truth that lies behind it. So we have, uh, I'm, I'm sort of kind of like in, 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 improv, just imp improvising to say this is we, we have a number of things on the table uh, that we can talk about. And uh, it would be even better when Harry gets here. <laughs> <laughs> and in, in Lincoln's fragment that you, that you yeah. mentioned about the Constitution and the Union, it's not even just that the Union's for the Constitution, it's that the Union and the Constitution are for the principles of the Declaration of Independence. And that principle is a principle that gives liberty to all, hope to all. And so Lincoln makes it absolutely clear that the very heart and soul, the apple of gold of the American Union and Constitution, 
are the principles of the Declaration. And if we don't live up to them, or at least attempt to go in the direction towards that rather than away from it, right. then essentially we are no longer this thing we call America. Lucas, you know, the, the left will say, well, you made an accommodation with slavery. But Frederick Douglass said it was the right accommodation. Um, he called the, con he said that the Constitution leaned toward liberty. It le so, as like I said, if you look at the, the accommodation, there was no, no mention of slavery in the text of the Constitution. No, in, no moral endorsement. He said covert language was used. As Albert Ellsworth said, so there'd be no trace of that odious institution when slavery disappeared. But as Lincoln said, we look, look at all the earmarks. Slavery was to be blocked from the, from the foreign slave trade. It was to be blocked from expansion within. <coughs> so if you take a look at it, all the earmarks were a policy meant to discourage and compress, not to promote and enlarge. So as you said, you put all these. The union with this prudential self, making it a combination with an evil for the sake of compressing good. That was done for the purpose of vindicating the principles. Right? So that, that's what made that's what made the prudential accommodation worth having. So worth it, right? And that it must ultimately resolve itself. Otherwise, the union without the principles of the Declaration of Independence, Lincoln says, I think this might have been in his speech at Philadelphia, um, is like a ship without without any cargo. The ship no longer has a purpose. You can't explain what the rationale is. Lucas, what's your take on that? I agree with it. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, you know the Woody Allen movie where he says, uh, Marshall McLuhan would agree with me, and he goes and takes Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> like, look, uh, if I can't bring it down, this, 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 this well, man will do it. Well, uh, what, I want, what I want to ask people is, um, who saw the Skip Gates documentary on PBS last night, Looking for Lincoln? Two hours. Uh, did anybody catch that? I t voted, thanks, Derek. <laughs> But I'm on the road, I was in D.C. Tuesday to look at a preview of the exhibit at the Library of Congress, which you must go to. This is not an option. I'm telling you, you must obey. <laughs> go there before it leaves for its cross-country tour. It leaves, I think, it's there till early May. It's at the Library of Congress. Uh, a spectacular exhibit uh, showing off uh, essentially their, their best artifacts and texts. Uh, the contents of Lincoln's pockets the night he was uh, assassinated, which included a Confederate five-dollar bill. Oh. Discuss. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it includes uh, the most garish thing on display is the a page from the uh, the doctor who was actually with one hand, uh, one hand Mom. writing. No, not that, no. not that doctor. The one working on Lincoln, <laughs> not his assassin. Uh, writing his account of what happened to Lincoln's brain and his left hand actually exploring that Lincoln's blood on this document. Uh, drafts of the first inaugural, uh, the second inaugural, the Gettysburg Address, and all other things. Um, uh, at any rate, in, in, in D.C. early for that, uh, and uh, this, this uh, morning, afternoon, a, a speech by Shelby Steele at Heritage Foundation on Lincoln versus Obama. Uh, you'll have to go to their website to do you see think what he said. Was a, 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 just a slip by Obama? Or do you think it no, it's intentional. Uh, it remember, think of his Philadelphia speech. The speech to kind of clear up the dust from the Reverend Wright yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, debacle. Uh, the title of that speech was From the Preamble to the Constitution, A More Perfect Union. So I think it was intentional. I think it was intentional not to date it. Uh, but but uh, not to date it to the Declaration, but to the Constitution. But to his credit, um, what did Obama do in uh, his inauguration address? Everyone said it's you know uh, the theme is a new birth of freedom, right? So we're going to get Lincoln coming and going. Almost nothing on Lincoln. He wanted all of it, right? And this was I think this was uh, not think I know this was delivered on his part for Obama. Obama. Everybody's been saying, oh, Lincoln made Obama possible. I think the most charitable way to read Obama's uh, a reference to the crossing of the Delaware and Payne's common sense. Uh, I think the most charitable way to, to read this is to say for Obama, it's the founders who made him possible. And I say charitable because he hasn't explained it in so many words that way. Uh, in Audacity of Hope, his second book, 
Uh, he talks a lot about the Declaration and the Constitution there, but he hasn't connected the dots in the way that I'm suggesting right now. I think it would be great if Obama said, no, not Lincoln helped make me possible, but it was George Washington, the slave owner. It was James Madison, the slave owner. It was Thomas Jefferson who owned over 100 slaves. And that immortal line, right, all men are created equal, which I think was Franklin's line, actually. Uh, but it was a gloss on Jefferson's original. Uh, that uh, what Obama was trying to say is, we got to accept all of it. We got to go back past Lincoln, uh, past even the Constitution, to that revolutionary struggle that produced this thing that we, in his mind, are still trying to perfect. Uh, the American but Union. But that's the thing done by those white slaveholders. So why is he, why is he, uh, um, he you know, he, that, that's how it's seen today and then the, on the left. The he's he's much so more careful in his discussion of the founders as uh, dead white European males, as they like to say in the academy. Uh, Obama, uh, and I think he's more careful not just in terms uh, uh, of getting elected, I, I think he has a more capacious understanding of the founders than uh, for example, the late uh, Thurgood Marshall, a Supreme Court Justice, who thought that that was a constitution, that that was a declaration that only applied to white people, uh, for white people, because it was by white people. I, th I think uh, uh, Obama... He called the birth of our nation a monstrous birth of that. So a very different take. You know, there's, there's two very, very different mm -hmm. ways of looking at the founding. Um, one of those is Lincoln's and uh, one is not Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Because Lincoln is very clear, despite any of the defects in the founding, that the, that, that principle of liberty to all, it gave hope to all. That that, if we lose that, if we get rid of that, if we don't respect that, then there isn't any purpose for he, this, he for this it union would be a in union the first place. not worthy of the saving. That's right. Remember, remember that, that Obama speech he gave on July 10th, 1858, where he saw, there were so many people assembled from before, they came from other countries, and yet they somehow had the sense that this regime was about them. Mm -hmm. How did they get that? Is that they, 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 and this is when people from abroad see us more, more clearly than we see ourselves. They saw all men are created equal as what he called the, the electric cord, right? that connected the generations. Sure. Uh, Al Brophy, I teach at the University of North Carolina. Um, and when Lucas was, and Colleen were both talking about how um, President Obama is, um, has a more nuanced view than um, uh, uh, Marshall. Thurgood Marshall, I was interested in how you see Obama fitting in or not fitting into African American thought about Lincoln and about the framers and sort of, you know, is there, is he connected to some people? And I'm thinking of your work on Ralph Ellison um, and sort of Du Bois. I'm just sort of wondering how um, Obama fits with this sort of larger American as well as African American. Yeah, that's a good question. I haven't really thought about it uh, in light of, uh, of African American political thought. For example, as a legal thinker, Obama is pretty much an adherent of Stephen Breyer's as, as far as I can tell. Uh, and so he doesn't come out of the tradition of, say, of a guy like Frederick Douglass, I don't think. Although he will laud a guy like Frederick Douglass. For example, when he uh, issued on February 2nd, the, uh, you know, the presidents always have this resolution that they issue declaring February African American mm -hmm. History Month. Mm -hmm. okay. Bush did it every year. Uh, they did it before then. The start of, of course, with Carter Woodson's week of black history it became a month. Uh, I think in 1976. Uh, and so when Obama uh, issued his resolution declaring this month African American History Month, um, he, I think, included Frederick Douglass. He didn't mention Du Bois, interestingly enough. Uh, and by name, he mentioned uh, several others, but Du Bois wasn't among them. But he's, he's certainly read Du Bois. Um, I, I'm still uh, unclear about his understanding, Obama's understanding of uh, the founders. Uh, I think, as I say, he has a more capacious, in other words, he, he wants to give them credit, but in a way not too much credit. Um, uh, by calling it a birth defect, right, it's um, his, his, he still, well, that was he's Thurgood got Marshall. that. Oh, Thurgood Marshall, Thurgood Marshall. there. Um, no, also, Connie Rice, Con Lisa Rice called it a birth defect as well, unfortunately, to my mind. Um, uh, I think Obama, in part because he's the product of 
uh, the modern legal uh, academy, I think he would ultimately side with the progressive understanding of the Constitution, which is to say, uh, it's not a static document, it's not fixed, it's something that gets better over time. Uh, the Civil War Amendments, I think he would cite as examples of that. Uh, and so, uh, I don't think it would be entirely Lincolnian, nor would it be, it wouldn't have the uh, uh, appreciation of the founders of Frederick Douglass did. So. You have to have a problem with people who face the question, would you sign the Constitution as it came out of Independence Hall? The Constitution, right? <coughs> without the 13th Amendment, without votes for women, right, right, right. would you sign it now? Yeah. Yeah. And people say, I just, people say no, or they say, is it, would you sign if you thought that it was, all the refinements were contained in the original principles, this matter of those original principles working their way out. So when you did votes for women, uh, the proponents had the declaration on their side. <coughs> Uh, the burden of proof uh, fell to people who would deny the women the right to be, the right to be that government by consent, right? Yeah, the but federal, so everything become, turns on that first principle. Mm -hmm. The federal constitution says nothing about women voting. There, we did not have to amend the federal constitution to allow women to vote. That's right. That's right. It was a state matter. If every state of the union wanted women to vote, as some did early on, New Jersey, yeah, among others, the um, and then they took it back. She got there were blacks and women. Uh, but blacks, yeah, in five states, including North Carolina. Because of just uh, a property qualification. It had nothing to do with gender right. or race. Uh, uh, well, the reason I brought up the Looking for Lincoln documentary was because it was just supremely frustrating to watch this. I'm not a historian. I'm a political scientist. I don't mind using the word scientist, but I'm a politics professor. They had no politics professors on. And they were talking about a man who was eminently political philosophical. And so they were talking about emancipation without making one reference to the Constitution in terms of what power Lincoln had as oh, president under Article 2 to do anything about slavery. And that segment was saved by the historian Jim Horton. They had the, if you, for those who watch, uh, didn't watch, they were around a table. Skip Gates, uh, Jim Horton, uh, Horton uh, Yale professor David Blight, uh, and Harold Holzer uh, was published uh, you know, a zillion books on Lincoln. Um, it, was Jim, it was left to Jim Horton to make the case that Lincoln was constrained as president to do anything with regards to slavery, in particular about slaveholders in the so-called border states, Kentucky, Missouri, Delaware, and Maryland. And that he was constrained not so much simply because tactically he needed, especially Kentucky, and Missouri, right? The old line, but Lincoln wanted to have God on his side, but he must have Kentucky, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but it wasn't simply a prudential matter, uh, keeping them along, uh, keeping them in the Union, but that Lincoln had no authority. In other words, the American people did not grant or vest a power in the president to do anything about people's property. Uh, Let's open this up to so discussion. Anyway, so that's what I'm, I'm, so. And, and, and I mean, what do you think? Is Lucas right about that? Um, it's certainly an interpretation of Lincoln, but, you know, play devil's advocate here for a minute or whatever kind of advocate. Um, maybe Lincoln should have done what was right and put right above the law, or not. What do you think? No, Lincoln, Lincoln thought the law was right. The law that allowed the, the slavery. The principle of law being it's a good strength. It's a good strength. It was. Right. It was the. I think he took from his experience in life that rule by law was mm -hmm. the most important thing, the most immediate, most um, uh, closest implementation that he he experienced as a human being that transformed his life. Even when he thought the law was wrong, right. as he does in the rendering of, of the Dred Scott yeah, decision, exactly interpretation. Right. But, there, but there's an actual law reason for that. Yeah, I remember George Washington's line, of what avail was it to establish the right of the people to govern itself if the laws made by those people need not be obeyed? Correct. Correct. You make a nullity out of the whole very principle of right. government. So which means this is why Lincoln's account of why we're obliged to respect those laws until we change it in the 
it's legal play. Or when in the course of human events. Right. Which is always out there as part of that document as well. He had that, that famous letter to uh, Orville Browning um, where he was saying, if, if a, a military man in the field has to take that farm as a matter of military necessity, he may take that farm and keep it as long as he needs it. But to say that the farm no longer belongs to the farmer or his heirs, he's, that's a confiscation. You, you, to allow you to do that is the overthrow of law. Let me, let me push this just a little bit more and make it even more difficult, perhaps, than the Emancipation Proclamation. So you live in Pennsylvania in the 1860s. And there are folks moving from south to north and into Canada along the Underground Railroad. Your obligation by law is that fugitive slaves have to be returned to their owners. What do you as a citizen, a good citizen of, this, of, of the United States of America do? Do you follow the law and turn them in? Or do you move in a Henry David Thoreau way beyond the law to follow your principles? What is the right thing to do in that situation? Down the river, send them to Ohio where they could be free. <laughs> but that's not what the law, right, requires. But do no harm. You feed them and you let them go. You feed them and you let them go. What does that do to your principle of the law being supreme? This is this is by the way one of the fundam one of the core questions that Stowe wrestles with in Up in Tom's Cabin. Oh yeah, right. So what is the right thing to do, Peter? I mean, because you're a human being, even not making a choice is making a choice, right? Making a decision. So no matter what you do, you've made some kind of decision. Because this is about human action, not just what we would wish. But, but what the situation is and what you will do. Um, I think I would break the law. Yes, sir. I would go with Stewart. There's a higher law, higher than the Constitution. And along with Seward and Lincoln, you would try to get that higher principle put in the law. Lincoln was great in that the Emancipation Proclamation, he was being a very good president in that he knew that he had to follow the Constitution. He only had powers granted by the Constitution. He took expansive powers as commander-in-chief, which was a good thing in my view. But also, he was taking a stand against secession, which he saw as anarchy and the destruction of a Republican type of government. If you, any time you don't like the majority rule, you pull out, well, what kind of society can you have? So. The rule of law is very important to him. That's one of the things that's inherent in saving the union. Ah. One of the things that's inherent in saving the union because, and if, if Chandra, if you and Lucas are talking about this tomorrow, we can, we can steer around this, I'm not sure, but, but of course where that statement goes is, a, is that very controversial point, right, Derek? When Lincoln says, the um, um, five to choose, between saving the Union and freeing the slaves. I choose saving the Union. Now, that can be interpreted more than one way. And Lincoln was nothing if not one of the most careful people with his words. He parsed them extremely cautiously. But that's one of the reasons it seems to be today because of that statement, that some people think that uh, Lincoln really doesn't stand for all the kinds of things that many people at the Union League think, thinks he stands for, you know, the highest caliber. That in the end, he was a politician. You know, wanted to do that practical thing of saving the Union, even if that meant going against his own moral principles of freeing the slaves. The Union, the union was the Union that was putting slavery in the course of extinction. 
so we simply, kind so, of we, so we simply restore the union as it was, with an anti-slavery majority consolidated, and new states being carved out in the West, then these would quite likely be free states. So it, if we just keep the union as it was, restore it as it was, we will have won. That was his point. Strategically, we will have won. And we know that the border states will not fight for, to end slavery. They will fight Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware will fight for the Union. But as I understand it was, but as soon as they begin to lose sons and fathers in the war, they will be willing to strike in slavery as a war measure to end the war. But to even bring it full circle, Hadley, I think Lincoln might have even gone even further than that, huh? that strategic. Yeah. Because to go back to what you were talking about earlier, um, <clears throat> A picture of gold in an apple of silver. The picture, the frame, uh, that's the silver frame represents the Constitution and the Union. Right. That's made to protect and adorn the picture of silver, or I'm the sorry, the picture of, of the apple of gold, which is the principle of liberty all, the Declaration. So the Union means nothing. It's a, just a frame without a picture. Uh, if it's not protecting speaking, those principles. And speaking of the frame of the and picture. And speaking <laughs> of the framer and the founder. The first, the first uh, philosopher of the United States. <laughs> Dr. Harry Jackson. Harry Jaffa received his BA from Yale in English Literature and his PhD from the New School for Social Research. He's Professor Emeritus of Government at Claremont McKenna College and Claremont Graduate School and Distinguished Fellow of the Claremont Institute for the Study of Statesmanship and Political Philosophy. He's the author of a great many articles and books including his widely acclaimed study of the Lincoln-Douglas debates entitled Crisis of the House Divided, an Interpretation of the Lincoln-Douglas Debates. And most recently, his book, A New Birth of Freedom, Abraham Lincoln and the Coming of the Civil War. His other books include, and I will just mention a few of those, <clears throat> because I, I want him to have time to talk. Thomism and Aristotelianism, The Conditions of Freedom, How to Think About the American Revolution, American Servitism and the American Founding, Statesmanship, Essays in Honor of Winston Churchill, and Original Intent, Original Intent and the Framers of the Constitution, A Disputed Question. He's also the author of a quotation you may have heard before, which I remember him once uh, remarking about that the phrase is simply a terse expression of the thought of Aristotle and Cicero. Here's that phrase. Extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. Professor Jaffa has devoted his life to the defense of liberty and the pursuit of justice, showing Americans the way to reclaim for ourselves and our posterity the principles of the Declaration of Independence and to revitalize that old, old new birth of freedom. Dr. Jaffa. I decided to make this the occasion to uh, write a little piece called How to Think About the Lincoln Bicentennial. And a short summary is that not the way they're doing it in Washington. So I've been asked to write a brief introduction to a 2009 Lincoln Bicentennial celebration. By the way, I can't, I, none of my glasses work, so I keep putting them on and taking them off. Uh, I hope, however, to make it an appropriate introduction to any and all such celebrations. From my perspective, this would be possible only if Lincoln's 200th anniversary is marked by the 50th anniversary of Crisis of the House Divided. The two things happen to coincide. Such an assertion may seem presumptuous on my part. My self-interest is perfectly trans transparent. Can you, can you? Okay. How is it now? I all right. Uh, 
from my perspective, this would be possible only if Lincoln's 50th anniversary, 200th anniversary, is marked by the 50th anniversary of Crisis of the House Divided. Such an assertion may seem presumptuous on my part. My self-interest is perfectly transparent, to use a phrase popular with our new president. But the truth is that Crisis was the first book or scholarly work of any kind on the Lincoln-Douglas debates. No understanding of Lincoln is possible apart from an, out, from an understanding of the events that took place in Illinois in the summer and fall of 1858. In fact, the presidential election of 1860 was really decided in Illinois two years earlier, although no one at the time could have known this. The initiative for these debates and the Senate campaign of which they formed a part are from Lincoln's uh, and, for, and, and for the initiative for these debates and for the Senate campaign of which they formed a part uh, come from Lincoln's House Divided speech, in which he said that the nation could not remain permanently half slave and half free. It would become all of the one thing or all of the other. Lincoln's critics, among them Stephen A. Douglas, said that this was an invitation to civil war as indeed it proved to be. This was the flashpoint of the, of the crisis leading to secession and civil war. It also marks the point, the point of, uh, read, read my own writing, it also marks the point of the resolve not to permit the nation to become all slave. It was the point at which Lincoln himself would either sink into oblivion or rise to inexplicable, inex, inexpressible glory. Lincoln's his, historical writing, Lincoln historical writing in the late 19th and early 20th century has been dominated by the progressive belief that slavery was di a dying institution and that the impersonal forces of progress would have ended it without either Lincoln or civil war. According to this opinion, the vehicle of, of, our, of true progress would have been Douglas's doctrine of popular sovereignty because it would have allowed the slavery question to be settled, peacefully settled in the territories as it had been hitherto in the states by the vote of the local inhabitants without pitting the whole nation against itself. Whatever theoretical shortcomings of the doctrine of popular sovereignty, e.g., who voted to decide, who would vote to decide, Douglas offered anti-slavery voters a way to defeat slavery without a moral confrontation in the arena of national politics. In the winter and spring of 1857-58, Douglas had led the Republicans in Congress to victory over the pro-slavery Lecompton Constitution for Kansas on the ground that it was not an honest expression of the will of the people of Kansas. In doing so, he had earned a high, a high place in the ranks of the, of the Free Soilers and a high place in the ranks of the Free Soilers. And many of them, particularly on the East Coast, wanted the, the Illinois Republicans to support Douglas for re-election to the Senate in 1858. Douglas, in effect, offered a way which seemed effective and easy. Lincoln, on the other hand, insisted upon the moral condemnation of slavery as the only sufficient ground to oppose it and place it in a path leading to its, quote, ultimate extinction. It was as the attraction of the easy way that Douglas appealed to free soil opinion, Lincoln's own, Lincoln's own followers. And that made the challenge of Douglas the hardest challenge of Lincoln's career. During the Civil War, Lincoln made the defense of the Union primary, and, and he could invite the support of those who cared little or nothing for the rights of slaves. 
But in 1858, the question of union was not, at least not, did not appear to be at issue. Lincoln had to fight the 1858 campaign on the basis of the moral, of the moral, of the natural rights of the slaves. When there was nothing, when, when there was nothing for which the voters of Illinois cared less than the natural rights of the slaves. Unless one realizes this, one does not measure the greatness of Lincoln's accomplishment. The predominant view of the historical profession of the 1940s and 50s was all on the side of Douglas. The academic view of Lincoln, led by the dean of all Civil War scholars, James Garfield Randall, the mentor, by the way, of David Donnell, who was carrying the uh, Randall's flag today, uh, and this is always on television, it's the authority on Lincoln, about whom we do nothing. <laughs> the, the, Randall regarded the, the, the raising, the, uh, regarded raising the morality of slavery as a political issue to be what we might call the axis of evil, of antebellum politics. Paradoxical, paradoxical as it may seem, a concern with morality has been charged by these celebrated Lincoln scholars with being the source of immorality. It was, and today, it was and is today, a widely held belief in the academic community that the moral differences concerning slavery, like all moral differences, could not be decided by reason. And, th and therefore, it was irresponsible to agitate the question. Yet the leading politicians of the day, North and South, whipped popular feelings to the boiling point because it was the, the, the route to their advancement. And of these politicians, none profited more from the agitation than Abraham Lincoln. It is in this context that my work on Lincoln may be viewed. I was, the, I was, however, inspired by Leo Strauss's method of reading the great books. It was necessary, he said, to understand an author as he understood himself before, before attempting to understand him differently or better. It was, Strauss pointed out, an impossibility to understand an author better than he understood himself without first understanding him as he understood himself. It seemed to me, moreover, that the principle, this principle applied not only to the reading of great books, but, to, but, to, but no less to political speeches, and in fact, to the past altogether. To understand the past a priori, as it understood itself, seemed to me to be the axiomatic premise of historical understanding. I, mean, I might say it was a premise which was recognized by, none of, not by nobody in the historical profession at that time or for the most part today. The attempt of the historical revisionists, as the followers of Randall called themselves, was that their understanding of the slavery question and indeed of politics generally was in every respect superior to Lincoln's. The three names in the archives followed by the greatest number of titles are Jesus Christ, William Shakespeare, and Abraham Lincoln. In recent years, Lincoln has surged ahead of the others. <laughs> ahead of the other two. Uh, if I read correctly, I've heard there's something like 17,000 titles after his name. Some years ago, someone observed that, that, the, that those subjects, that the three subjects that commanded the greatest uh, the greatest market among book buyers were Lincoln, Doctors, and Dogs. <laughs> the perfect title of a book, it was said, was Lincoln's Doctor's Dog. <laughs> of the 17,000, all but, but a mere handful have no substantive interest, uh, but, but may have, have the substantive interest of a good dog book. Many were written out of a genuine love of Lincoln, and of course, Lincoln lovers, like dog lovers, 
are always gratified by the presence of another votary of their, at their shrine. But those that love Lincoln and those that hate Lincoln and the passions of the Lincoln haters exceed any other passions in American history are almost equally distant from the passion or reason of Lincoln himself. Not long ago, I had a letter from someone who each year celebrated the birth of, uh, birthday of John Wilkes Booth. For him, Lincoln was a tyrant and Booth a martyr. In a world dominated by the moral relativism that dominates our universities today, there is, there is no objective basis for distinguishing tyrants from martyrs or right from wrong. All moral judgments are said to be, quote, value judgments. Uh, and, to and to prefer Lincoln to Booth is no less subjective than to prefer Booth to Lincoln. Both the pro and anti-Lincoln literature have been grounded in unexamined assumptions as to who is the hero and who the villain. Lincoln said he never had a political feeling that did not spring from the principles embodied in the Declaration of Independence. The book which has consciously or unconsciously dominated Lincoln and, history, and Civil War historiography is Carl Becker's 1922 book on the Declaration of Independence. In that book he wrote, quote, to ask whether, okay, I can turn two pages here. He, not he, he asked to ask whether the, the natural rights, whether the natural rights philosophy of the Declaration of Independence is true or false is essentially a meaningless question. To Lincoln, this would have been the most meaningful of all possible questions. He could not for a moment have asked the Union soldiers to make the sacrifices that they did make if he had had the slightest doubt that the last full measure of their devotion had been given to a cause less than God's own truth. How does one begin to understand Lincoln as he understood himself? In 1858, Lincoln wrote that the central idea, 1856, I'm sorry, Lincoln wrote that the central idea of the founding from which all its minor thoughts radiated was the equality of man. In 1859, in a, let a letter celebrating, Jeffer celebrating Jefferson's birthday, Lincoln wrote, quote, all honor to Jefferson, to the man who, in the concrete pressure of a struggle for national independence by a single people, had the coolness, forecast, and capacity to introduce into a merely revolutionary document an abstract truth applicable to all men and all times. At Gettysburg, Lincoln said that the nation at its birth had been dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Clearly, the abstract truth applicable to all men and all times is the proposition that all men are created equal. How, how many historians, whether Lincoln scholars or not, have taken seriously the idea that there are abstract truths, whether, whether they are whether this or any other applicable to all men at all times. The consideration of such truth is a sphere of philosophy. And the philosophers all reject it, so why should anybody else follow it? Uh, what is the evidence, whether abstract or empirical, for human equality? First of all, it is not a denial of individual differences within the human family. It is an assertion of the nature shared equally by all members of the human species. It is an assertion that there is nothing in these, in their common nature that makes one the ruler and the other the ruled. Accordingly, there is no difference between one human being and any other human being, such as uh, is between any human being and any member of an inferior species that affords a rational justification for one being the ruler and the other being the ruled. It is accordingly in the natural order, inherent in the great chain of being, 
that the human rider be the ruler and the horse the servant. Man is indeed, as the Bible says, the Lord of creation, but there is nothing to justify the subordination of one human being to another as there is to justify the rule of man over beasts. Thus, one human being, that one human being is more intelligent than another of more, or more virtuous is not, is not a ground of subordination or superordination. The, the ground for such for subordination and superordination appears, however, when human, be, human beings form political communities. They do so in virtue of a social contract, transforming them into fellow citizens of a common government in which the strength of all is pledged to the defense of each, and the strength of each is pledged to the defense of all. It, <clears throat> excuse me, in organizing their government, lawful offices are commissioned requiring the obedience of citizens. If the, if the citizens are to find safety from enemies foreign and domestic, there must be a command structure. There must be rulers and ruled. The defense, the deference that citizens give to officers of their community is not personal to the officers. It is a recognition rather that the officers are useful for the protection of the equal rights of all for whom they entered into uh, the equal rights for whose sake they entered into the contract that gave life to the government. It is a pledge of each to all and of all to each in fulfilling the, the pledge in, in fulfilling that pledge, it is the interest of, of each and of all that superior intelligence, that superior intelligence and superior virtue be recognized and deployed. Each of us has, in the last analysis, an ultimate interest in being governed not by our equal, but by our superior. We seek to be governed medically, not by ourselves or by our equal, but by highly trained physicians. But we want to be sure to be, but we want to be able to choose that physician. We want to be able to, uh, to choose to ourselves to choose that physician and to have assurances that he will govern us for our good and not for any private advantage of his own. In general, we seek, we seek to be governed by the wise, but we want to have assurance that their wisdom will be to our advantage and not for any selfish ends of their own. How, how the rise of the many may, through the consent of the governed, be transformed into the rule of the wise. How equality of opportunity may properly, be, may properly, under, be properly understood to be transformed in, excuse me, how equality of opportunity may properly understood transforms democracy into aristocracy, completes the task of Link, the tale of Lincoln and the Declaration of Independence. And now I'm at your mercy. A Socratic conversation is upon us. Who would like to go first? Questions? Peter. Do you think there's a, a, a real disagreement um, between Lincoln and Aristotle on this? I'm, I'm guessing that overall you would want to say that they are in harmony with each other, and yet... That's what I do they, say. Yeah, well, and, and so... <coughs> at the end of the day, however, I, I, I just get the sense from Aristotle that, um, um, you know, that there isn't the social contract, that... There, that um, he's, he's further from endorsing uh, um, democracy in the way that Lincoln does. And so does, Eric, does, does Lincoln think that he has seen some things which um, the ancient politicians might not have quite been aware of? Or how, how would you, could you say more about how you bring I can it? say more. I can talk for the next four or five hours, except I couldn't <laughs> last that long. And I've been doing a lot of writing on the subject lately, so uh, that you couldn't have asked the question which <coughs> more up my alley. 
<laughs> the, the Aristotle's politics was written in the world of the ancient city. The ancient city, which is best described, by the way, in Fustel du Collange. That's the one book that Leo Strauss always recommended. It's about the only secondary source that he, he, he did recommend. But the ancient city was based upon the uh, upon divine law. Uh, I frequently use these days the Old Testament, uh, not for any sectarian religious purpose, but as an illustration of what an ancient city is. Because the idea that the law comes from God, which we know, are familiar with from the Old Testament, was true of almost every ancient city. Plato's laws begins with the Athenian stranger asking the Cretan and the Spartan whether their laws come from some man or from God. And they answer, God, God. In fact, the first word in Plato's laws is God. Uh, and the Cretan says that uh, Apollo is the author of the laws of Sparta, and Zeus, or his son, uh, uh, I forget his name now, is the author of the laws of Crete. And uh, of course, Athena was the, the goddess of Athens, and we know about her. We built a, tub, a, tub, a temple to Athena, and we put, Winston, uh, put Abraham Lincoln in it. So, uh, the, so the question of the, of the, of the source of obligation uh, in the ancient city was not, a, was not really a question, and it's not a question which is really discussed in Aristotle's politics, uh, because the, the hoi polloi at least accepted the authority of God. And, uh, and uh, in Athens, that's, if, you, if you proposed a law which, which was not in, in harmony with the laws of God, you could be executed on the spot. So, but the, uh, the rise of uh, the, the Rome's conquest of the ancient world really put an end to the ancient city by putting an end to the gods, because the defeat of the city meant the defeat of its gods. As we just, that's, you see that in the Old Testament. God is the warrior of the city, and uh, the Israelites are defeated constantly, but for somehow their God does go away the way the other ones did. So uh, the question of, uh, uh, that, that, say, a, a writer like Locke faced, from whom Jefferson and ultimately Lincoln derived their ideas, was to uh, find a source for law which was, uh, which was not from God coming down from above, because the Christian God is a monotheistic God, but he is not a law-giving God. And that deprived, you might say, post-classical politics of the ground in divine law that was the ground of the ancient city. So the social contract was a means of, of finding an, an alternative source of obligation, which was also consistent with divine law, because at least in the Declaration of Independence and in Locke generally, the the rights with which all men are equally endowed are the rights with which they've been endowed by God. So the, the authority of God comes from the people. So, it's, so that's where, where the social contract, the, the origin of the idea of the social contract is in the, you might say, in the death of the ancient city and the, the replacement of the polytheism of the ancient world with the monotheism of the Christian world. But, with, but, the, but the, the, the Christian God does not and cannot be the author of the municipal laws of individual cities or nations. Uh, the way I mean, the the God of Israel is only the author of the God, the laws of Israel. But we needed the the end of the ancient world meant there needed to be a different source of, of political obligation. So I'm, if Aristotle had confronted the situation that the, of the post-classical world dominated by Christian monotheism. I think he would have written a second treatise. Can I focus in on something sure. specific? It's just very political and, and, a, and a more of a, just a specific part of the whole world of things that you're pointing to. Um, and that's just whether some people don't have more talent, ability, excellence mm -hmm. that qualify them to rule over other people, not necessarily as masters over slaves, but as political rulers. Well, the, the last part of the paper I just read dealt with that. Once the, the social contract is, is a contract of equals, because by nature, no man or woman is the ruler of another. But uh, all, everyone, although created equals, 
stands in need of a stronger force to protect themselves and their natural rights than they, than they have, have by themselves. The obvious answer to the problem is the creation of government. And the social contract is one which, in which each person agrees with all and all with each that they shall be governed by uh, laws for the common good. And it's understood that in the protection that government offers uh, that, that nobody's life or liberty should be considered more important than anyone else's because to, to do that would be to violate the original equality which uh, governs the, the forming of the social contract, the forming of government. But once government is formed, then the question of what government can best per fulfill the task that everybody wants it to perform, then distinctions of, of uh, talent, strength, uh, education, intelligence. Uh, obviously, if you want a general, uh, you don't want McClellan, you want Grant. <laughs> So the quest for the best qualified uh, is, you might say, the, the motivating quest for the political process uh, in a government based upon the equal, the equal rights of all. And, but the, remember, the rule of, what we mean by the rule of law is, is the equality of rights which flows from the social contract and which governs the purpose of government. It is not the purpose of government to protect the property of the rich, but not the poor, or the poor, not the rich. It's a, it's a function to, per, to protect property and individual uh, uh, safety and security. Nobody, once a social contract is formed, nobody can say the government should protect me more than somebody else because I'm better than the others, because anybody who holds that view is, cannot be a citizen of that community. Uh, but the, the, the quest for, I mean, one of the, uh, my favorite quotes these days is, is uh, in, from uh, Jefferson's letter to John Adams. I too believe in a natural, arist in a natural aristocracy. The, the natural aristocracy is the most precious gift of nature uh, for the management of the affairs of, of mankind. It would have been inconsistent in nature to have formed man for the social state. You can't get any more Aristotelian than that. Uh, and uh, shall we say that that form of government is best which provides the most effectually for the pure selection of the natural aristoi into the offices of government. And that quotation from Jefferson is used by Leo Strauss in his essay on classical political philosophy to define as best he knew the meaning of the best regime in Plato and Aristotle. <laughs> so inequality follows from equality, yes. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned at the outset of your speech that you were not entirely satisfied with the, the way the Lincoln Bicentennial is being celebrated uh, right now in, in Washington. I'm just wondering why, you know, what the source of that dissatisfaction is, uh, and uh, how you perhaps would suggest we should actually be celebrated. Well, I, I very modestly propose that, the, that that they should celebrate my book along with Lincoln's Bicentennial. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I've, I've hinted at that, but nobody took it up. Uh, I can just as an example, some, this is about a year ago, there was a, a, a C-SPAN 3 uh, 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 discussion of Lincoln uh, with John Hope Franklin uh, was featured, and, and this was Kurt, Kurt Smoke, I think, the former mayor of Baltimore, and Eileen Makovich, who was the, director, the executive director of the Lincoln Commission, and who I've made friends with, and we talk back and forth all the time, but the, the program was, and she was there as a sort of moderator. Well, it was there to exhibit all the great powers and virtues of John Hope Franklin, uh, who, in my opinion, is uh, one of the worst Lincoln scholars we've ever had. Uh, in fact, I can illustrate this, but back in 1967, there was a, a, point, a committee, commission appointed by Governor Kerner of, uh, then Governor Kerner of Illinois, to investigate the causes of all the, the riots going on in American cities. And one of the conclusions of the Kerner Commission uh, was that, uh, that the, many of the causes was the, the endemic racism of the United States as a nation. And uh, as evidence of the racism of the United States was the fact that, that the Declaration of Independence did, in saying that all men are created equal did not include black uh, people. Well. 
This was one of the great issues in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, because Tawney, in, this, in, in his opinion, said that, that, that he said that, that the Negroes were not included in the, in the Declaration, and that if they, if they had been, then the people who signed the Declaration would have abolished slavery. But since they didn't abolish slavery, they didn't include the Negroes. Well, that opinion of Tawney's has become, you might say, uh, orthodox uh, faith doctrine, uh, left-wing scholarship by Lincoln, and a man by the name of Lerone Bennett wrote a whole book of attacking Lincoln on that basis. Uh, it's just not true. But the interesting thing is that, that, uh, that, that uh, the, the Kerner Commission adopted this opinion. I called up the director of the commission and I said, where did you get this opinion from? He said, well, we got it from the highest authority, John Hope Franklin. So any, anybody who thinks that, that the Negroes were not included in the Declaration agrees with Tawney and Douglas, but ignores Lincoln. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that gives, gives you, anyway, I called Eileen on the phone and told her I thought the program was terrible. <laughs> and, and, and I said everything that, that John O. Franklin said was wrong. Well, it turned out she was one of his students. <laughs> but she didn't try to defend it. <laughs> but she, she, she invited me to make my own program, and I said, well, go ahead. You, if you can set up the program, I'll be there, but I can't be in the business of arranging television programs. Maybe you can cite what um, Lincoln said in his speech on the Dred Scott decision that explicitly um, uh, rejects that view. This they said and this they meant. Well, uh, Lincoln simply argued that, uh, that this was a uh, the Declaration of Independence was, uh, he didn't cite Jefferson and Locke, but he, uh, he might, as a matter of fact, he didn't do this, but one of the things that, the best pieces of evidence on the whole subject is the, the Declaration of the Right of the, of the uh, Necessity of Taking Up Arms issued by the Continental Congress uh, one year m minus one day before the Declaration of Independence, 1775, July 5th, I think it was. And the very first sentence that the American people addressed to the world, he says, as a, as, because they were fighting, they didn't declare independence yet, but they did declare that they were not be subject to the King and Parliament of Great Britain. And the very first sentence, they said, it's, it's impossible to, to think that people endowed with reason could believe that one set of men could have an absolute right of property in another set of human beings. This was against all reason to believe that anything could justify slavery. So uh, this, uh, and uh, another great document on this subject is uh, Alexander Stevens' uh, Cornerstone speech which I think I dragged out of the recesses of the archives when I wrote How to Think About the American Revolution. It's a speech that uh, Stevens was, became the vice president of the Confederacy. He had been a Whig congressman, and he had been a good friend of, in fact, he and Lincoln were among the so-called Young Turks who got, got General Taylor to run for president in 1848. Since uh, no, much, no matter how much they admired Henry Clay, they were tired of losing with him. <laughs> like Tom Dewey, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Stevens. Uh, by the way, his, his full name, by the way, was Alexander Hamilton Stevens, and De and Jefferson Davis's whole name was Thomas Jefferson Davis. So Thomas Jefferson was president, and Alexander Hamilton the vice president of the Confederacy, and they didn't get along to better, any, any better together than the original. <laughs> But Stevens uh, was a, uh, had given a speech in the Georgia legislature during the, the uh, leading up to the, the secession convention, in which he opposed secession. Uh, and he, it's a, it's a wonderful catalog of all of the tremendous advantages that the South had had. Uh, in fact, if Don Fernbacher's last book on the, the, the slaveholding republic. Uh, he could have taken all his chapters titles, the, 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 the ambassadorships, the judgeships, the presidencies the, which the South had enjoyed during the, the period up until 1860. And I suspect that one reason he was chosen as vice president was to carry the 
the anti-secession movement with them into the Confederacy. Anyway, he gave a speech, which uh, I'm not sure of the exact date, but it was in April of 1861. It was exactly halfway between Lincoln's inauguration and the firing on Fort Sumter. So it was at a time when it was quite reasonable to believe that the Confederacy was a permanently accomplished fact and that no civil war was to be expected. And in that speech, he, he, he said that at the time of the founding, uh, every, all, everyone concerned believed in the equality of races. They, they thought that slavery was an evil that would somehow would pass away in, in the event in time, although the Constitution gave, gave every reasonable guarantee to the slavery that existed, it was based upon the assumption that slavery was a transient phenomenon. Uh, but Stevens went on, but they were wrong. Science has since proved that Negroes are inferior and that the best condition for both Negroes and whites is one of slavery, see. So, but he gave complete credence to the, to the, uh, the view that Lincoln held at the time of the Dred Scott decision. And I might say, by the way, as a, as a and uh, let me go back a step and say, that uh, Tawney in the Dred Scott claimed that, to, that the founding fathers had regarded Negroes as so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect, and that it was perfectly legitimate to reduce the Negro to slavery for his own good. This was the view that Tawney attributed to the founding fathers. Uh, it was clear that Tony, that he said that at our time, meaning in 1857, we know that Negroes are part of the human family. Uh, as a matter of fact, this was you know, just on the eve of uh, the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species, but the idea of evolution was uh, throughout, was in all the air of the time. And uh, so what, what Tony was saying was that they were ignorant of Negro rights, we are not. We are governed by their, by what their work, because the, the intention of the lawgiver is the law, and we must obey the. Uh, we as judges have no right to, to, uh, to substitute our preferences for theirs. You see, uh, among the interesting pieces of evidence that I made use of is it was not a secret, although it was not widely known. Is Tawney made a speech in 18, in 1818. He was there was a. Uh, a, um, a Methodist pr preacher uh, who named Grub Jacob Gruber in Frederick, Maryland, who made a speech before 2,000 people, including 400 slaves. Uh, and uh, he was indicted for seditious libel, for inciting slaves to revolt. Uh, and he was defended by Tawney. I usually read Tawney's speech and then ask people who do they think made the speech. But <clears throat> Tony, in his speech to the jury, said he was speaking, in fact, not just for his client, but for himself as well, in saying that he had a, a, a natural right to, to, uh, to say what he thought about slavery. And he gave what is, in some respects, the most perfect anti-slavery speech ever given. There's everything that Lincoln said is an, anticipated, and anticipated beautifully, because Tony was a great writer even if he was an SOB for other reasons. <laughs> Great writers can be SOBs. Uh, so uh, there, was no, there was no question that all the evidence contemporary with the founders showed that they were anti-slavery, as Alexander Stevens himself insisted, even in giving his defense, because he, he said, said that the Confederate States of America was the first government in the history of the world based upon this new scientific truth. Of, and he compared the truth about the race to uh, Harvey's discovery of the circulation of blood, Galileo's discovery about gravity. And he said, all those great discoveries were not accepted immediately, but they were in, in, point, in, in time. And he was sure that the discovery of uh, the Negro inferiority and that the cornerstone of a, of a true republic was, was, was uh, Negro slavery. Uh, so, You know, Harry, when I was visiting at Princeton, I met a, a woman who's a graduate student in 19th century history. Mm -hmm. 
I said, ah, already we're divided, because I think that proposition, as Lincoln called it, was what he thought, an axiomatic truth. And she said, he thought it was true at the time, <laughs> right? It was, the, she absorbed the historicism. And she was a student of, of McPherson, Jim McPherson. So as, but, so as you look at, these, at the historians who are doing this, they're celebrating Lincoln, but the point is, do they, uh, they, they can't be celebrating him for the right reasons or giving an accurate account of, of well, uh, I'm, I'm, I, I want to be moderate in my statement about my brother's scholars. Right, as usual. <laughs> and, and <laughs> my usual. Uh, well, uh, the, 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 there's the forthcoming issue of the Review of Politics is going to have two articles about my work. Oh. Well, one by Robert Cranach and another by Mike Zuckert. And Mike Zuckert has, for, for a long time, held what is, I think, the essence of Eastern Straussianism, namely that we hold these truths doesn't mean we think them true, we, we just hold them. <laughs> and uh, so, so, so he's given a, a, a comprehensive critique, and, so, and I've written comprehensive answers to each one of them separately, so the show should be published. In. What about somebody like McPherson, who's really a famous hist historian? Uh, yeah. the, one of the famous historians. Well, uh, Don Fairberg is a, is a great writer, great, and, and the superiority of his work, apart from his, his technical competence, is the fact that he was in deep sympathy with everything Lincoln thought and believed. But he didn't think and believe that Lincoln believed anything, an abstract truth applicable to all men at all times. He couldn't, he, he could not, con I could not convince him that when Lincoln said, I am not now and have, never have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes or permitting them to marry with white people, that this was not a direct expression of Lincoln's opinion. He thought that Lincoln shared the views. Lincoln wanted his audience to think they were, you know, because that's, you know, you can't be the leader of people who you tell you don't, you're a bunch of fools, you don't understand anything. Uh, but, uh, uh, Alan Guelzo, in his very good book on the Lincoln-Douglas debates, but he, the only point he criticized Lincoln was for saying what I just quoted in the, uh, at the Charleston debate. And, uh, <clears throat> but he quoted Lincoln up to a certain point, but he didn't quote, finish the quotation, because Lincoln had said that he, he had, did not know a, a man, woman, or child who was in favor bringing, or bringing about the perfect equality of the races. And the only case, and this is the part that, that Guelzo didn't quote, was the only person he ever knew of and had heard of so often as to be satisfied of it was, was Judge Douglas's old friend, Colonel Richard M. Johnson. And why Lincoln went out of his way to mention Colonel Johnson, uh, you can say, uh, he was showing that it was possible to, and Colonel Johnson, well, most people don't even know who he was, but he was Vice President of the United States under Martin Van Buren. In fact, he was the only Vice President ever chosen by the Senate itself, because uh, he didn't get a majority in the Electoral College, and, and so, so the choice went to the Senate, and he was, but he was an old-fashioned Jacksonian. He'd fought in the, in the, Mex in the War of 1812 and was wounded and, and had a government pension the rest of his life, but he was a faithful uh, ally of Andrew Jackson and, and rose to the, to the top of the group there. And so he got, J I think, Jackson's approval to be vice president. But the, the Dictionary of American Biography says that he never married, but he, but he uh, had two daughters by Julia Chin, who was a mulatto who he had inherited, I think, from, I don't know which family. She was very much the same relationship that Sally Hemings had to, Jefferson and Jefferson's wife. She was Martha Jefferson's half sister, but they had the same same father, different mothers. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, there's only one biography of Johnson, which is uh, the only place I could get any really source of information. Apparently, he treated Julia Chen as a as his wife. She manages his household, and he and he provided his two daughters with the same, his two, quote, black daughters, with the same kind of education that Jefferson provided his white daughters. Uh, and uh, 
when what when, and he uh, he he gave portions of his estate he gave to both his daughters uh, when he was alive because he, if it was left in his will it wouldn't have been valid but uh, and both of them married white men and I'm sure all their descendants have long since passed into the white community but one of them died before her father and uh, uh, and uh, uh, Johnson received a condolence letter from some friend, and he replied to it by, by, by speaking of how much he loved this daughter, and how what a wonderful child she was, and how she, she and without her he can't, he can't imagine, but she has gone to a better place, but I've been left behind. It was a kind of eulogy that King Lear might have given to Cordelia, and it was absolutely Shakespearean and beautiful, and uh, it's a beautiful example of uh, how a perfect equality was possible. And Lincoln put that in the text there, and, and Alan <laughs> didn't quote that part of the, of the thing where, but it was perfectly clear that in the Lincoln-Douglas debates, you have to see that, that the basic strategy of Douglas was to, uh, to pin racial egalitarianism on Lincoln, and Lincoln's strategy was to pin pro-slavery on Douglas. And, and both of them told the truth, and, neither, and both of them denied it. I mean, so, so uh, anyway, uh, uh, Lincoln, uh, as far, even Don Fanbrock, I couldn't quite believe that Lincoln did not share the prejudices uh, of his audience, even though he, uh, in Illinois, but in Southern Illinois, Lincoln didn't carry Sangamon County in either 1860 or 1864. But uh, uh, anyway, that's, do yes. you think some of these ideas on uh, slavery were more cultural because of the agricultural community and the Romans used to make slaves out of wherever they captured? It was like an evolution of ideas? Well, uh, I, I recently wrote a piece for the Claremont Review of Books in which I replied to the attack on uh, the United States by the, Obama's pastor, what is his name? R uh, R right. Jeremiah Wright. Uh, and I gave a, a sort of quick survey of American history in which I, I, I made, wanted to make the point, first of all, that there was no black slave sold into the Western Hemisphere who hadn't been enslaved by another black before. The people who sold the slaves were black. And, uh, and in fact, when, when some of the, uh, the uh, missionaries who were going into uh, to Africa uh, and uh, trying to, to uh, oppose the slave trade, and they came to these black chiefs who were selling the slaves and told them this was wrong, and they couldn't understand what they were talking about. It was a good deal, you know. You got good money for them, why not? So, but the, uh, the, the uh, origins of slavery clearly uh, arise from a kind of, uh, kind of economic pressure. Uh, the, the Puritans and the Cavaliers who, who found Massachusetts and Virginia and, people and all the communities that spread from there, they, they had this huge continent to, uh, and uh, all the land in the world, uh, but they needed labor. And somebody discovered that the original, the first slaves in Virginia, where there was a mixture of white and black uh, the, the whites were indentured servants, but there really was no, no sharp distinction between indentured servants and, and slaves. But as time went on, the blacks became really slaves and the indentured servants, servants could, could uh, leave their indentures after the, the period that was, was up. Uh, but the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the pressure for, uh, for a cheap source of labor, and uh, and the blacks proved to be very good laborers, as the Indians were not. So they couldn't couldn't make slaves out of the Indians. They, they wanted to go hunting. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, well, uh, in fact, the importation of, of coolies and to help build the, the railroads in California, where, and they dug the holes through the mountains and got caught in the landslides that the white workers did not. So it was, it was a similar, similar kind of economic pressure. And the profitability was so great that 
uh, it would have taken more virtue than, uh, than almost anybody had to have resisted that at the time. Uh. Please join me in thanking Dr. Harry.